Our Father in heaven, we thank thee indeed for a Savior. We thank thee for the words that we have been hearing, for Jesus is the truth, the way. And Father, we thank thee that not only is he a truth or a way, but according to the Bible, there is no other way to God. And while many would look at this as a negative thing tonight, that God has only provided one way, we must look at it in the positive and say that, thank God, he has provided a way. A way whereby lost, guilty sinners can be brought to God. Surely, Father, there is something lost in our society when we begin to consider that a man would rather have many ways than even one way, one perfect way, one glorious way. And, Father, we thank thee that he could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thankful for this. We're thankful for every person who has taken the time to log on to listen to the word of God tonight. May we all be considerate about the distractions that could come up in our own homes and give our attention to the reading, the preaching of the word of God and the gospel. We pray for our brethren, Meekin and Pratt, as they continue to preach. We think that uh, around the globe, really, today, some having already uh, close their eyes at night on this Lord's Day. And the gospel has been preached. Father, we pray for each brother who preaches the cross and for each listener that their hearts may be reached. Give us help tonight to read. Give us help to speak. Power from God is what we need. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Now let's turn, please, in the Old Testament to Genesis in chapter 24 tonight. The book of Genesis Chapter 24. You'll remember Thursday evening, we read in Genesis 22. Genesis 24 is for this gospel preacher, the sequel to Genesis 22. And we begin reading in verse number three. Now Abraham has taken his servant and he's going to make him swear, or he's going to make him promise. Verse number three, And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son, Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure. And that's a way of the, the King James saying, Perhaps, or what if, the woman will not be willing to follow me onto this land. Must I needs bring thy son again onto the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware that thou bring not my son thither again. Interesting, isn't it? He's not to go back. Isaac is not to go into that land. Verse number eight, And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Verse 10, and the servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed. For all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he rose and went to Mesopotamia onto the city of Nahor, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city or outside the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. Now, if we go down, we will find in verse number 15, that Rebecca comes, and Rebecca is the one to whom he is guided to bring this blessing, this message, and this offer. Verse number 22, she had now given water to his camels, and it came to pass as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of a half shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is her room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? Now, in verse number 26, the man bows down his head and thanks the Lord because the Lord has led him just to where he should be. They go now back to her father's house or to her, her uh, family's house. In verse number 34, the servant now begins to explain something that is the key. This is the key to understanding the story of Rebecca. And he, that is the servant, said, I 
I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him, unto who? The son. Unto him hath he given all that he had. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughter of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but thou shalt go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, and he goes on to repeat some of what already taken place. Now verse number 53, And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And in verse 57, and they said, we will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, wilt thou go with this man? She said, I will go. Verse 61, and Rebekah arose and her damsels and they rode upon the camels and followed the man and the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well. It's beautiful. Verse 64, And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done, and Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah. And she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. You'll understand, of course, that in a chapter of 67 verses, you have to select certain ones that will be relevant to a 25-minute gospel message. So we have left some of the details out, but there are some things here that I want to show you that are going to make you think. They're going to make you think, how does this apply to me? How does the story of Rebecca, a woman in a far country, who has brought a message of blessing through a man of God's choosing, to receive blessing through a man, how does this apply to me? What are the pictures here that are given to us that could be relevant to our listeners tonight who are sinners lost? and away from God. But as we face the, the, the thoughts or, or how this applies to us, let us remember we're going to have to be honest and face some difficult facts. As we view this, you're going to be presented with your personal responsibility in the gospel tonight. For often... Oftentimes we speak about the power of God, don't we, my brethren? And thank God the Bible teaches of a God who is sovereign, a God who has authority, a God who has power, a God who has ability, a God whose hand is not shortened that it cannot save and his ear is not heavy that it cannot hear. We believe 100% in the biblical presentation of the sovereignty and authority of God in salvation. But we also know that for every listener of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is the responsibility to respond by accepting Christ, by faith in Christ. This servant for us is a picture of something that really is an ongoing work in the world today. You'll remember in Genesis 22, we saw that Isaac was a picture of the son, a picture of the Lord Jesus who went to the place of sacrifice, and who came back down from that altar in picture of resurrection. It is really an illustration for us of the Lord Jesus going to the cross of Calvary and coming back in glorious resurrection. Abraham is a picture for us of God the Father. As Isaac moved in harmony with his father to that place, so the Lord Jesus moved in perfect obedience to his father to Calvary. But now this servant is a picture for us. The son having gone to the cross, having been raised again from the dead, 
We now have the servant as a picture of the Spirit of God who is currently searching and bringing the gospel message to sinners. According to the Bible, God is calling out of the nations a people for his name. That is, a bride for his son. You understand in the New Testament, that's what the church is referred to as, don't you? A bride for his son. And every person who trusts the Lord Jesus Christ is a part of that beautiful bride. And herein we have the picture. The servant is the Spirit of God going out with a presentation from the Father, with the content of that presentation being the Son. And with that presentation comes a promise of great blessing. And with that promise of great blessing comes a responsibility to respond. You see it, don't you? And if you see that picture, we need to begin now at the beginning. When Abraham is about to send the servant, and he says, bring not my son thither again. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Two things that we are faced with here. The first thing is this. If this woman is going to receive the blessing and be the bride of Isaac, She's going to have to respond to the message that is sent. She's not going to see his face and then have an opportunity to respond. She's not going to get to come and visit Isaac and to see him in his tent or to see him with his cattle or to see him with his father physically. She's not going to have that opportunity. She's going to have to respond to the message. And in responding by believing the message, she is really believing the person who has sent the message. That really is the principle of faith in the Bible. Lest you may have considered faith to be something mystical and magical, it's not. There's a message that is sent. The character of the person who is speaking is what's a question. If you reject the message... You are saying, God who has sent the message is not true. God who has sent the message is not trustworthy. God who has sent the message can't be believed. You see, so many people are looking for more than the word. That's why I came about this this afternoon, just thinking about this particular part of the passage. As we're preaching the gospel, there are tons of people who are just waiting and wanting and looking and wishing that they could be saved, but they're looking for something more than God's giving them. God, Abraham said, you make sure you don't bring my son there. You send the message. If they believe the message, they can have the son. She won't believe the message. Well, that's her responsibility. Are you looking for something more than God is giving you? Think with me for a second. You know that sin is the problem. Are you look looking for something more than the death of Christ on the cross for sin? That's what God's giving you. And I know that there are people here listening tonight, and you're thinking, Oh, all of the complications, all of the different things. If I could only see the cross, if I could only touch the Savior, if I could only lay these eyes upon what was happening there at Calvary, then I know it would be true. You know what you're saying? God's word is not enough. If the cross is not enough, there's only hell for you. And if God's word is not enough, there's only eternal destruction. You see, what God is giving is not only enough, there is no more. So while you keep flipping over stones and trying to find the missing link in salvation, God is saying, I have given you my son and I'm giving you my word. You take that, you receive the blessing. But now we move. 
We move as this servant now goes into the land searching for the one. Searching for the one that God is going to lead him to. You see, because God is over all of this. There's not going to be any accidents by the well in Mesopotamia here, my friends. It's going to be all directed by the hand of God. Why? Because God knows that woman. God knows her history. God knows her past. God knows her character. God knows what she's done. God knows what she's thought. And God wants to bring her a message of blessing. Now remember, there's more than just this woman that's going to benefit from this event. Isaac is going to benefit. Isaac is going to receive the bride that will comfort him in his mother's death. Isaac is going to receive the glory that there would be in that wedding day when he gets to present Rebekah to all of those in his father's house who are looking on, all of the servants, all in the community. He gets to display Rebekah, the bride who is chosen and brought to him personally. My friends, let us not forget, while we as the people of God might not be much to look at, there is coming a day, oh, there's coming a day, when in his presence, we will be presented without spot, without wrinkle. This is not my gospel message, but my brethren, the gospel brings glory to the Lord Jesus. And in the end, there's going to be glory received by Christ as the bride is presented, glorious and perfect, without blemish. But right now, we see this woman. This woman meeting the servant at the well. And as she meets the servant at the well, she's a bit confused. We understand that. As she meets the servant at the well, she may even be a bit fearful. And yet, as she meets the servant at the well, she listens. Now you got to listen. See? This message is going to contain tidings of great blessing. Good news. But she's going to have to listen. And as she's listening, she hears about a man. She hears about a man who has great wealth. A man who has great means. A man who is able to provide beautiful things, not just necessary things, but thank God Abraham had those. But he's able to provide beautiful things, glorious things, lovely things, and wonderful things. She hears about that man. And then the servant is just good enough to bring out some of those beautiful jewels, the earring and the bracelets. That's just like when you hear the gospel, my friend. And you begin to get a glimpse of the glories of Christ from the scripture and the wonderful blessings that God has for you if you were to believe what God is saying. Not only things that are necessary for life. Thank God God is giving eternal life. Thank God he is giving a, a forgiveness of sins. He is giving peace with God, all of those things. But when he brings out the gold and the silver and he begins to present those jewels of beauty, you know what he's doing? He's showing all the glory, not just of what she can get, but the glory of the person he's representing. Before we're done with this message, you will know that this entire blessing is going to be wrapped up in a person. This entire presentation is going to come back, not to the riches of Abraham, but to the glory that the riches of Abraham display. The glory of who? The glory of Isaac. And again, I say, as I've said in nights past, one of the most difficult things for the gospel preacher is to tell people how truly wonderful it is to be saved. Listen to me, my friend, when I tell you not only are the things that God has for us wonderful, but the person is glorious. And I've been saved now for almost 19 years, and for the first almost 24 years of my life, I knew verses from the Bible, but I never understood the beauties of Christ. 
And for the first years, even after I was saved, I would read my Bible, and sometimes I would read my Bible as a hard, calloused, old, cranky Christian. Any of those listening tonight? You read your Bible, and you say, yes, I have to do that, and I have to do that, and I have to do that. And look at Procopio. He's got to start doing better. And Flynn, he's got to start doing better. Yeah, sometimes we read our Bible like that. Oh, but my friend, I have never been so happy and full of a joy unspeakable as when I am finding Christ in the Scriptures, enjoying him. You know, being a Christian is a wonderful thing. But being a Christian who's enjoying Christ is a fantastic thing. And he begins unfolding here now the glories of the man that he is representing. And he gets an opportunity to present a little message to these people. And he says, Abraham, my master. He's Abraham's servant. And the Lord had blessed him greatly. He's become great. He has flocks and he has herds and he has gold and he has servants and he has silver and uh, maids and he has camels and he has asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bear a son. And unto him hath he given all that he had. So now, now, it goes from just the things that Abraham had to a presentation of the son who's the heir of all things. And from this point on, my friends, we need to know that if she is going to receive the goal, she must take the son. If she is going to receive the silver, she must take the sun. If she is going to come and be able to, to witness and to be able to partake in all of the flocks and all of the herds and all of the men's servants and all of the maid servants and all of the asses and all of the camels, she must take the sun for all of the blessing is reserved for those who will take the Son. You know, in our New Testament, we read that he that hath the Son hath life. And it really is the New Testament's way of saying this. Eternal life, you can have it. God wants you to have it. But in order to receive it, you must take the Son. The forgiveness of sins, you should have it. God wants you to have it. But in order to receive it, you must take the sun. A home in heaven, you must take the sun. Peace with God, you must take the sun. All of the blessings that God has to offer are tied up in a person. And he that hath the sun has everything that God has to offer. And I tell you tonight again, if we come across as preaching salvation as a thing, and we start to wander and preach the gospel as a cold material possession that you can have, we've missed the mark. Because far from being a cold material possession, salvation is actually possessing a person, the son. So now she knows. She knows that the blessing is connected with a man. And he comes and, and he begins to talk to her, her family as time flies. And, and he begins to bring forth more jewels when he's talking to her family. He brings forth gold. He brings forth uh, clothing. He gave precious things to her mother and to her brother. It's just a picture now that uh, even Rebecca, who's going to be the object of the offer, she's going to see that her family is blessed as a result of what's taking place here. Tell you, my friend, that's a blessing. When the gospel comes into a home, now I'm not talking about when religion comes into a home, and I'm not talking about when someone turns over a new leaf or when someone uh, tries to restart their life. I'm talking about when the power of the gospel is made evident in the real conversion and salvation of a soul in a family. There's a testimony there and a blessing that is brought in. But here we have it. You see, don't you? 
The servant is sent. It's a picture of the Spirit of God bringing a message. She must listen to the message, for that's all she's going to get at this point. It's a message about a man. She now has been presented with the blessing. And as he's presenting her with the blessing, he brings it in and ties it in to a man so that whoever wants the blessing must receive this man. And having presented her with all of the facts and all of the glories and all of the things that were pertaining to Isaac, there's the question that now comes to this woman. I'm not waiting around anymore. You don't need a lot of time to think about this. I've given you a message about a man. Wilt thou go with this man? Now, I understand that's pertaining to the servant here. But my question to you tonight is about our Lord Jesus Christ, as I presented to you a message from the Bible about a man. Wilt thou go with this man? You see, you're not going to get any more from God than this message. And you never need any more from God than Christ and God's Word. And your response tonight is going to be based on whether or not you believe what God is saying. Never forget that. But for every person who is willing to believe what God says, and every person who would love to have what God gives, and every person who will take the sun, the question is tonight, will you go with this man? Thank God she said, I will go. Picture continues. It's beautiful if you love it. For those who love the Lord Jesus, we can't help but see that as Rebecca is being guided by the servant across the desert, it's just a picture of we as the Lord's people traveling through this desert drear and wild. The servant, the Spirit of God is our guide until that day when we come face to face with Isaac. The Lord Jesus comes again. As my time is gone, I face you again with the question from the Bible. Wilt thou go? with this man. We're going to continue reading in the scriptures from the Gospel of Luke, please. The Gospel of Luke and chapter 8. Verse number five of Luke chapter eight. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, verse seven, and some fell among thorns, verse eight, and other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. Verse 14, And that which fell among thorns are they which, when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and with riches and pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. Chapter 13, please. Luke chapter 13, verse number 6. And he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, 
Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year. This year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. And a final few verses in John's Gospel, chapter 12, please. John chapter 12, verse number 27. This is the Lord Jesus speaking, verse 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Trust the Lord will bless what you've heard, along with the reading of these three portions of scripture. If you followed the reading, I tried to emphasize a little expression in each reading. The first was this life. We started out with a wide picture, this life. And we narrowed it down in chapter 13 of Luke to this year. Then we come to John's gospel and the Lord Jesus said this hour. Life, the year, the hour. I want to speak to you about this life. Sometimes life is easy. Sometimes life is hard. The Lord Jesus spoke about the cares of this life. And the snares of this life. And the pleasures of this life. God has given us this life. And yet there's things get in the way in this lifetime that hinder us from the very purpose of this life. To be very clear, the whole purpose of this life is to prepare for that life. And if you miss Preparation in this life, you will miss that life. God has made you for eternal life. He's given you physical life to prepare for eternal life. And if you fail down here in this life to prepare for that life, better for you that you were never born. This life. The first thing, after the Lord Jesus told the parable of the sower, the very first thing the Lord Jesus talked about is the awful predator of this life. Then cometh the devil. First thing he said, when he started explaining what the different seeds sown in different places were, the first one was the seed that's sown on the pathway, the wayside. Then cometh the devil. That's your number one enemy. That's my number one enemy. That is the predator of this life. He goeth about as a roaring lion, Peter tells us, seeking whom he may devour. Then cometh the devil. Not very far away from where the Lord was working. The devil was working. As the Lord was sowing the seed, the devil was snatching the seed away. As we are sowing in the gospel tonight, there are those of you sitting there, and the devil is taking it away. You're easily distracted. Things just come and go. You hear in one ear, and it's almost like there's a channel going from one side to the other. I know there's not. But it's in one ear, out the other, snatched away and gone. That's the work of the devil. He's an awful predator. First thing I noticed about him is he works immediately. He doesn't wait. He works immediately. Then cometh the devil. As soon as the seed hits the ground, 
the birds of the air flock in. They snatch away the seed. The Lord Jesus said, those birds are a picture of the devil. Then cometh the devil immediately. He works constantly. He never stops. He never stops. You may stop, but he doesn't stop. He just constantly, constantly at it, distracting, turning you away, taking away the seed, constantly. Then cometh the devil. And thirdly, he works tirelessly. The Lord Jesus told another parable right on the back of this, and he said, while men slept. But the devil didn't sleep. He works tirelessly. For what? Why is the devil so tirelessly working? So that you will be lost. Thank God there's a God that works tirelessly that you might be saved. That's why these meetings have continued. I got to tell you, I'm tired. I'm tired. I've been preaching now for almost nine weeks. I'm tired. Why are we working tirelessly, even though we're tired? Why do we keep this going? Because there's someone else that's working, and he's not going to stop until you're lost. Therefore, we preach that you might be saved. We continue to sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed, so that you can take it, my friend, so that it'll fall upon good ground, and you grasp the seed, and you get eternal life. An awful predator in this life. But the Lord Jesus also said, that there's wanton pleasures in this life. They're, they're just made to distract you. The, the pleasures of this life choke out the seed. That's the seed that fell on the ground where the weeds started to grow. And some of you have been distracted. You might even be saved and you've been distracted. You might not be saved and the devil is still distracting you. That's what this world system does. It is headed by Satan himself, but he has a whole system in place just to keep you distracted in the show, in the bright lights, in the glamour, in the high life, in the highs, in the drugs, you name it, in the pleasures, just to keep you going from pleasure to pleasure, distraction to distraction, and before you know it, this life is over, and you're not saved. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. Oh, the awful pleasures of this life. But he spoke of the problems of this life. And I don't want to be unsympathetic. There are people that have weighty problems, problems that crush them. The Lord Jesus spoke it, spoke about it as choking, choking problems, choking grief. Our hearts were broken here in the east again in that helicopter crash. The young woman was killed in that crash just the week before for someone else she stood and sang a solo, Amazing Grace, apparently a beautiful voice. And she sang Amazing Grace to ease the grief of others that were choking. A week later, they played her own singing at her own funeral. As that crash went down, and there's a family in Ontario tonight that's choking with grief. I don't belittle that, friend. That's life, and all the griefs and all the choking cares of this life have the same effect. They keep us occupied and away from Christ and away from the sea. I can tell you this now, because the dear man got saved and he's in heaven. But a few years ago, Uncle Stan's son got sick, Gary. I went to the hospital with Uncle Stan, and it became very clear that Gary wasn't going to make it. He had a brain tumor. 
And Uncle Stan and I went down to the cafeteria to get a bite to eat. He hadn't eaten for over a day. I said, come on, Uncle Stan, you need to eat. And as he sat at that table nibbling on a bun with no appetite to eat, choking with grief, choking with care, I said to him, Uncle Stan, you ever think about your soul? I can still remember. He put up his hand. Not now, John. Not now. I can't think now. I can't. I can't. And the man wanted to be saved. But I can't think now. Don't you see, I said, Uncle Stan, don't you see what the devil is doing? Whether it's in good times, whether it's in bad times, you've always got a reason why you can't be saved. You're being choked. You're being choked up with the cares of this life. And the cares are real. Oh, they're real, my friend. But they have a choking effect. Now, thank God, two days before Uncle Stan Linstead died, he trusted Christ as his Savior and lived long enough to prove the reality of it. I thank God for that. But all the choking cares of this life. Let me tell you before I leave this, this life has a wonderful privilege. The sower went forth to sow the seed. What a privilege to listen to the gospel, not to listen to Procopio, to listen to God in the gospel. What a privilege to have poured into your ear, Christ died for the ungodly, to have come into your soul, the wonders of the person of Christ, the loveliness of the Son, that God has put all things into his hands, and all who have the Son have life. He that hath the Son hath life. That's what we were hearing. What a privilege to hear the gospel in this life. The seed is sown by the Spirit of God, by the Lord himself, sown right into your soul. Oh, may your soul be good ground tonight. Open up, my friend. Receive the word of God. Receive Christ. What a privilege that you could be saved this very night. What an opportunity is yours. Oh, what an opportunity. I thank God I had the opportunity to hear the gospel. My best friend grew up about eight houses down the street from me, Steve Surratt. We did everything together. We Rode cars, fixed cars, went to school, went, served, did everything together. Worked together, played together from the time we were six and seven years old. And yet, Steve knew nothing of the gospel. And I was always going to gospel meetings. Couldn't understand it as a kid. Here we were right on the same street. I had all the privileges. He had none. One day in the schoolyard, the top of our street was the school that we went to. Steve and I were up on by the basketball hoop. We had climbed the pole because we had some friends down below and they were trying to shoot some baskets. My job was to knock out the ball so they couldn't get it in, and Steve's job was to knock out the ball so my boys couldn't get it in. We were only kids, and that's what we were doing up there. And, of course, as we were whacking at the ball, we started whacking at each other. And we had a little kind of a fight. We were best friends. We had a little bit of a whack fight up there. And I said to him, Steve, you need to be saved. I don't know where that came from. I said, you need to be saved. He looked at me and he says, are you saved? I said, no. Well, he said, then there's no difference. You know, that hit me like a, an arrow from God. I can remember coming home from school that day, and I could not get that out of my mind. With all my privilege, with all that I knew about the gospel, the boy was right. There's no difference. No difference. What a privilege you have tonight. You could be saved. The sower went forth to sow. In this life, 
you could be saved. Oh, my friend, don't you leave this life. You make sure of it. Don't you close your eyes in this life until you're saved. For to leave this life without Christ is to be lost for all eternity. We'll turn to chapter 13, and we read not of this life, but we read of this year. And we've taken a whole lifetime, and we've brought it right down to the last 365 days of it. This year. It seems this tree that the Lord Jesus was talking about was most likely the nation of Israel. It was the people. He was talking not about trees now. He's really... He's really not concerned about the planet and the trees. He's concerned about the people on the planet. When God so loved the world, he loved the world of people, not planets, not trees, people. And so when he's talking about a tree planted in a vineyard, he's talking about a very privileged place that this person has. Am I talking to someone there tonight? You've got a very privileged place? That no matter how far you've gotten from God, you've got a mother and father that never stopped praying for you. What a privilege. No matter how far disobedient you've been to the gospel, you've got preachers that still care for you. You've got people that still pray for you. You've got a home where parents still love you and care for you. What a privilege. But the owner of the vineyard comes in and he looks at this privileged tree and he says, well, it's only been a year. Give her another year. And after a year, he comes back and says, I'll give her another year. And three years of kindness and care, three years, that's a long time. Three years, kindly, lovingly, tenderly, caring for a tree that produces nothing, nothing but leaves, no fruit, nothing, just an empty shell, just an empty show of leaves, but nothing worthwhile in the life. All its fluff and all its waving in the wind and all its activity, yet nothing, no fruit. Is that your life? Three years of undeserved grace, the kindness of God, year after year after year, God lavishes kindness upon you, and nothing, no response. Three years, the owner of the vineyard comes, and we read, seeking, seeking. How long would you seek? He's been seeking you for three years, day after day after day, season after season, experience after experience, trouble after trouble. He's still there, still seeking your soul, still seeking to save you. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, and no response. What a privilege. So he comes in one day and he says to the dresser of the vineyard, cut it down. I'm done. Why cumbereth it the ground? And the dresser of the vineyard says, Lord, let's put it on probation. I know it's been a privileged tree. Let's put it on probation for one year. Just one year. And we'll extend all the privileges for one more year. You know what worries me about that? Is we don't know when that conversation took place. What if that conversation took place last May? On the 3rd of May... 2019, the Lord said to the Holy Spirit, 
See that young boy? He's had enough. There's no response. See that old man? No response. And the Holy Spirit turns to the Lord and he says, one year. Extend your grace for one year. And the Lord agreed. And here we are a year later now. This is May. And in this year of probation, what have you done? What have you done with Christ? What have you done about your soul? I know there's some of you listening tonight and you've said, I will be saved this year, but you're not saved. So easily distracted, so easily turned back, so easily caught again in the world, so easily just, just the fluff of leaves, no fruit for God. One year of probation. But the Spirit of God said, I'll give her extra attention. Extra attention. More than I gave her in the last three years. More than I gave him last year and the year before. I will extend my attention. I'll dig about it. I'll shake it to the roots. I'll shake it to the core. I'll bring him through hard times. I'll give him good times. I'll pour in the water. I'll pour in the gospel. I'll deal with the core, the root of the tree, so that I can bring life into it. Extra attention. Maybe that's why this whole COVID-19 has struck, so that you could get extra attention. And two men that had no idea they would be preaching the gospel together at this time were brought together, not through planning, brought together and are pushed into these meetings, preaching the gospel, willingly, gladly doing it, but no planning to do it. Why? Because maybe there's just one boy here. Maybe there's a young lady listening tonight, and God says, I've got one, one year of extra care. I'll pour it in. I'll give her six weeks. I'll give her seven weeks of gospel to see if there'll be fruit. What a probation. And maybe for the first time in your life, you've started putting the eternal priorities first. Instead of all the tinsel and bubbles of life, you're starting to look seriously. Maybe it's because of a pandemic. Maybe it's because others have died and are dying, but you're starting to look seriously about eternal realities. That's what the probation is all about. And if, that's what he said, if it bear fruit well, because there was a purpose in all this. Absolutely. There was a purpose in the extended privilege. There, there was a purpose in the extra activity. There was a purpose in bringing eternal realities before him. Why? If it bear fruit, that's the purpose. That's what God wants. Listen, my friend, anything, anything is worth it if it brings forth fruit. Anything is worth it. It is worth stopping the entire world if you get saved. For all eternity, you'll thank God that he brought the world up short. It's worth it if it bring forth fruit well. Well, that's what he's looking for, fruit. If not, oh my, if not, then after that, thou shalt cut it down. Oh, my friend, there's always an after that. There's always an afterward. I don't even want to talk about the afterward of the Christ rejecter. I don't even want to talk about the afterward of those that turn away from all the dealings of God. Oh, my friend, don't let it be said of you. He had his privileges. 
He had dealings with God. He had great searchings of heart. But he never moved. She never moved. After that. Almost seems unthinkable that the grace of God was finally exhausted. I don't know, friend. You exhaust God's grace, there is no hope for you. His grace is amazing. His grace is boundless. I would almost like to say his grace is exhaustless. But I think the Lord has let us in on a little secret here. There comes a point where the door is shut. May that never be your case. Take this year. Take this year. Make sure you get to Christ. Because we've read about one hour. Or come down to just one hour. And in the last minutes of this meeting, I want to again present to you the man of this hour. The person of Christ. Christ said, for this cause came I unto this hour. He came for this very hour. Would you not give him one hour of your attention? Would you not give him one hour? He came to this hour. He came right to this time period. Often when the Bible speaks about an hour, it's not talking about 60 minutes. It's talking about a period of time, a point in time. The Lord Jesus had reached that point in time, and he calls it this hour. For this cause came I unto this hour. Would you not look with undivided attention at this hour? He came to this hour for you. He came that you might be saved right to this hour. He's standing before the cross. He's looking at Calvary. He knows that in a few short days, he'll be nailed to that tree. And he's come to this point in his life. He's come to this very hour of all eternity past. He looked forward to this hour. All the way from heaven, all the way from the past ages, right into this hour. And now the time has come when he'll lay down his life for your sins and mine. Would you not pay attention to this hour? He has come to this hour just for you. Just for you. It's the only way you'll ever be saved. Forget the world. Just for you. The hymn writer has asked the question, and rightly so. Was it for me? Was it for me? He wept and prayed when prostrate in the garden lay. Was it for me? Those hours in Gethsemane? Was it for me? He bowed his head upon the cross. Was it for me? He freely shed his precious blood. And oh, thank God for the chorus, for everyone tonight that can say this. It was. It was for me. Yes, all for me. Oh, love of God, so great, so free. Oh, wondrous love. I'll shout and say, he died for me, my Lord, the King. Don't miss the person of this hour. You miss him, you miss heaven. But sadly, the Savior talked about the judgment of this hour. That's what we read. Now is my soul troubled. Now is my soul troubled. Oh, the troubling of the soul of the Savior. And you, my friend, are not troubled? Not troubled in your sins? When here is one, the holy, spotless Lamb of God, the Son of God from heaven, and he was troubled for you, troubled for our sins, troubled because he knew the awful judgment now is the prince of this world cast out. Now is the judgment of this world. Almighty judgment would fall on him. No wonder his soul was troubled as he faced the awful consequences of our sins being placed upon him. But as Peter tells us, 
he bear our sins in his own body on that tree. Thank God he did. Oh, the trouble and the judgment of that hour, the awful punishment. The prince of this world, that's the devil. That's the one that's snatching away the seed. And now finally, finally on Calvary, the Lord is going to accomplish something that will hinder his work forever. He is the stronger one. He is going to put him down. He is going to make it possible that even the devil can't keep you from God's salvation. The Lord Jesus is going to defeat him at Calvary. The prince of this world is cast out. He is going to go to the cross and thereby open the door to heaven and all of hell and all of the devil and all his cohort can't stop a soul from entering that door. Thank God for that. There is salvation for you tonight. You can be saved because Christ has died. Christ has paid the price. Christ has set Satan to one side. Christ has conquered him so that you could be saved. Had it never been done, friend, you could never be saved. But he did it. And you heard the other night that he cried, it is finished. Lastly, I must close. Sorry, I went over time. Oh, the potential of this hour. What an hour. And I, if I be lifted up, the Lord Jesus said, right on the back of this, if I be lifted up, I will draw. I have drawing power to bring people to myself. How is that? Because of the cross, my friend. There's a magnetism to the cross. It draws people. Christ draws people to Calvary. Are you being drawn to the cross tonight, my friend? Then come there and bow your, your proud heart. Throw down everything that comes between you and Christ and bow at the foot of the cross and trust the Lord Jesus. He's drawing you tonight. I feel it from his word. I feel it in my own soul. I know it through the preaching of the gospel. I know it from what Christ said. I will draw. And he's drawing sinners to himself tonight. Would you come? Just as you are, in all your brokenness, and trust him. And he says, all that come unto me, I will in no wise cast out.